Okay, guys, we started with a uh, bit late given the fact that the class was so Enjoyed being here so much that I stayed a little longer than usual. Um, so, the last thing that we did uh, before we, we left last week was uh, um, to look at. <coughs> small piece of uh, the documentary tonight we looked at specifically the last thing that we looked at in that video was um, we looked at uh, Chile and economic growth in Chile and what sort of resulted in and that experience and some of that, uh, some of that growth. Um, we talked about the states as regulators right before we watched that piece, okay, uh, sort of linking what states basically are responsible for what they do to basically ensure uh, that they protect or that they uh, foster certain industries. And how we decide which industries are going to choose to do that too is largely dependent on um, obviously a variety of factors, one being whatever they might view as being one of their competitive advantages. What we're going to do now to start off is we're going to watch that little piece of it. And this is just, if you remember, again, we talked about Chile in the last, the last little bit that we watched. This one looks at Bolivia. Um, and uh, really all it does is it talks about some of those subtle differences between uh, two basic, you know, uh, two, uh, two Latin American countries uh, that are both trying to sort of industrialize and grow. Um, and some of the techniques that they use to try to do that, right? So, um, this idea of mixed economies versus, you know, from this sort of evolution from a connect economy, which is essentially controlled and planned, uh, to a mixed one, okay? Um, and then again, when, when you do reach that mixed stage, which ones do you protect, and, you know, which ones are government controlled and regulated, which ones are not, on the economy side of it. So, yeah, so we're gonna watch the last this little piece. There's two more pieces. The other pieces are really small. Like one, one's like three minutes, and the other one's like four. Um, this one's about 15 or so. So we're gonna watch this, and then we'll go. countries in Latin America, and with a history of 189 military coups, Bolivia was also one of the most unstable. When I was going to college in Texas, first question you'd be asked is who's the president of Bolivia this week? Second question down the road was you're from Bolivia. Ah, Bolivia. What's the inflation rate of Bolivia this week? because we had galloping hyperinflation that destroy our economic base. We found that Bolivia was the seventh highest inflation in the history of man. 23,500%. Prices increased by the hour. The cost of food and clothes kept increasing. Before it was all over, the total inflation averaged 1% every 10 minutes. Seven out of 10 Bolivians have been in poverty. The poor people get hurt even more. So you guys understand what, um, what inflation is, right? Okay. Anyone want to define it? Or explain it, just in case? <coughs> We all, we all know what inflation is, right? What is it? The prices go up. The prices of, sorry? Prices go up. Yeah. yeah. The prices go up. The prices go up. Purchasing power remains the same. Um, and basically, you, you hit a point where people can't afford uh, to, to basically purchase uh, things that basically exist in that, like, within that marketplace. Okay? Cost basically increased. For the, you know, basically the buying power remains 
things down. So hyperinflation is basically what happens at a hyper level. See their pockets be eaten away by inflation that is galloping around. It's like a tiger. Hyperinflation, if you'll kill it, then you only have one bullet. It'll eat you. The root of the problem was government finances. The government was spending 30 times more than it received in taxes. Across the continent, Latin America's uncompetitive economies had been piling up debt. In the 1970s, a massive hike in world oil prices left foreign banks awash with petrodollars. So here were the international banks with billions of dollars and nowhere to earn interest on them. They discovered Latin America. We were offered unreasonable amounts of money. These banks, who are very unwise in their lending policy, came to the happy conclusion that countries don't go broke. It's true, but sometimes they don't pay. Guess what? One day, these countries could no longer afford to repay their debts. In 1982, a financial crisis in Mexico triggered a chain reaction that caused the 1980s to be known as Latin America's lost decade. Bolivia was probably the most severe case of how things have gone wrong in Latin America. For decades, they just printed money. They collected no taxes. You can't collect taxes, you have to make money up somehow, and so you just printed it. It was a basket case. We were considered hopeless. We had help from nobody. We were totally alone. The World Bank had closed its office. The IMF had pulled out its representative. And the American government and other friendly nations wouldn't answer the telephone. At 29, economist Jeff Sachs had just become one of Harvard's youngest full professors ever. In 1985, some former students sent me a note asking whether I would be ready to come to a meeting with a group of visiting Bolivians. The Bolivians had come to Harvard to take part in a seminar on the hyperinflation that was ravaging their country. I was absolutely fascinated, made a few observations. Uh, somebody in the back of the room piped up and said, well, if you think you know what to do, you come to La Paz. Because we're going to beat these guys and you can come to work for us. 
So they all laughed. I said, oh, that's very interesting what you have in mind. Uh, and I described a few elements, uh, basically how to stop a hyperinflation. And he said, no, no, you have to go much beyond that. You don't understand. We need so much more. You're just going on the surface. This country needs a complete overhaul. We've got to get out of the mess that we're in. I wasn't sure whether he was provoking me, whether he was kidding, whether he was sober, whether uh, he knew what he was doing. It turned out that this was Gomi, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada, uh, a genius. Gomi's party did win the election and he became Minister of Clinton. He told the President that Bolivia was running out of time. We told him, you have 90 days before Bolivia's hyperinflation becomes the highest inflation in world history. So he told us, okay, you have 20 days, you have to start working now. There was a big discussion whether you could stop hyperinflation or inflation period by taking gradual steps. And this, Jeff Sachs was influential. He said, all this gradual stuff just doesn't work. When it really gets out of control, you got to stop it. Like in medicine, you got to take some radical steps, otherwise your patient is going to die. To avoid leaks, they work at home. Every few days, Goni reported to the president. We said, look boys, you got one chance. And remember, as Machiavelli says, all the bad news at once, the good news little by little. So he said, get it all done. Chuck therapy is get it over, get it done. Stop hyperinflation and then start, start rebuilding your economy so you achieve growth. In August 1985, Goni went public with a program called Shock Therapy. It caught everybody by surprise. It had great credibility. It was a shock. Shock Therapy spelled the death of dependency theory. Government spending was slashed. Price controls were scrapped. Import tariffs were cut. Government budgets were balanced. We uh, didn't use highly sophisticated uh, economic theory to deal with hyperinflation. We just used very simple things, such as from now on the government will only spend what it gets. You get one peso, spend one peso. You get two pesos, spend two pesos. If we don't have it, we don't spend it. No borrowing from the central bank, and therefore the central bank uh, did not have to print money. Shock therapy meant that the price of essentials, transport, food, fuel, all shot up. <laughs> Until then, people had thought that only a military dictatorship like Chile could impose such tough measures without tearing society apart. Bolivia may be a small country, but it had a very big impact in terms of kickstarting reform throughout Latin America. In Brazil, a former professor who actually used to teach the dependency theory launched a program of economic reform that looked a lot like shock therapy. Argentina was suffering from 20,000% inflation, and the new president of that country said, you know, we've seen this movie before. Pro-market reforms uh, could be implemented under uh, democracy, and we demonstrated that it was possible here in Argentina. All across Latin America, governments began to sit up and take notice. I think the Bolivian experience did have influence. The fact that we did it in democracy, we did it without great social violence, had impact on economic thinkers and on politicians. In the late 
1985, as we were struggling late into the night with the problem, he said, you know, this is extraordinarily hard, uh, but what's happening here, this is going to have to happen all through uh, Latin America. I watched it unfold one country after another. It is a curious fact of history that what happened in Bolivia was to have a direct impact on the frozen economies of Eastern Europe. I was approached by a Polish government official who had watched the Bolivian reforms and then had seen the work that I had done in Argentina and Brazil. He finally asked me, well, would I go to Poland and help? themselves feared that they were descending into starvation. These shops were utterly empty for miles. I would see a, a woman just standing on the street sobbing. There's no milk in this city. I can't find any milk for my child. What am I going to do? It was terrifying. Sachs arrived on the very day that roundtable talks agreed there should be free elections in Poland. But the situation was more than dramatic. One can change a political system overnight, but an economic system needs years. System economic system needs years. Whenever Soviet power was challenged in Eastern Europe, the response was very clear. It was tanks, it was the Red Army. That was the case in Berlin in 1953, Budapest in 1956, Prague 1968. The answer was different in Warsaw in 1989. Solidarity won 99 out of 100 seats. The head of the Polish Communist Party called Moscow for directions. Mikhail Gorbachev's answer was stunning. Do nothing except the outcome of a free election. And that was really the phone call that ended the Cold War. And of course, the great symbol of the end of the Soviet Empire was the fall of the Berlin Wall. One country after another broke free of communism, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania. 1989 was truly a miracle year. Poland was free. Now solidarity had to liberate the Polish economy. Late one night, Sachs met the solidarity economist Jacek Kura in a Warsaw apartment. I was trying to explain it how you get out of this mess that the communist system had left behind. Every couple of minutes, pound on the table. Back, back, back. Yes, 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 me. I understand. And we go on, back, back, me. And it was very, you know, it was, it was really exciting. We went on for a few hours like this. I was exhausted. The roof was filled with smoke. He said, okay, clear it. Right out the plan. We got up and said, uh, well, this will be a, a great honor. Uh, we'll send you something just as soon as we can. No! Tomorrow morning, I need the plan. <laughs> I laughed and he said, I'm absolutely serious. I need this written down now. wrote up a plan that night and delivered it the next morning. They distributed it to the solidarity members of the parliament. 
Like Sachs, Solidarity's new finance minister, Leszek Balcerowicz, believed transition had to be rapid and massive. Just after breakthrough, there's a short period, the period of extraordinary politics. By definition, people are ready to accept more radical solutions because they are pretty euphoric of pressure regained freedom. One could use it only in one way, by moving forward very, very quickly. Poland decided to do what Libya did, to introduce shock therapy, cut back on government expenditure, and try to do some market system and see if it could work. Prices almost doubled, and shortages didn't end. All Balcerovich could do was chew his nails and wait for the law of supply and demand to kick in. But then, after a few days, farmers began to bring their produce to market. I was going for a walk. And they were looking at the prices in the shops. The prices of eggs. His aides told him to concentrate on the price of the eggs. If eggs appeared, if eggs got cheaper, the market would be working. Eggs did appear. And then the price of eggs began to fall. And I remember that very important day when the prices of eggs are falling. This was one of the signals that the program, stabilization program, is working. <laughs> but reforming state-owned heavy industries would prove a much bigger challenge. Once Poland became free, one of the problems I had to face was a fight about privatization. The big problem was the old industries inherited from the communist past, and there there were wrenching problems of unemployment, of making them efficient, keeping them running, and that's where you saw a lot of the, a, a lot of the pain. Making overmanned, state-owned industries efficient or profitable meant wide-scale layoffs for Poland's blue-collar workers. When I became the Prime Minister, the euphoria of transition was almost over. We had 20,000 strikes, sometimes organized by my former colleagues from Solidarity Movement. Solidarity began to lose support as workers felt the pain of reform. I was asked uh, to go to some factories uh, to meet uh, with workers to try to explain what my vision of this might be. In the beginning, we were made to believe that it wouldn't take long for things to get better. Sachs gave us a rosy vision for the future of our economy. We soon found out that the program imposed on us from the outside most harmed precisely those folks who had contributed so much to political freedom. But elsewhere, the market was flourishing. Tens of thousands of small businesses sprang up, and the Polish economy began to boom. You suddenly had thousands of people trading the same products in front of the state-owned shop, but at a much lower price. This is phenomenal because it shows enormously entrepreneurial uh, drive of the Polish people. When you have your five minutes, take it. When the Polish people finally got that opportunity, 
they took the chance. They used the chance. At the Soviet Embassy in Warsaw, a special observer from Moscow had been monitoring the economic reform. Thoughts? Um, again, so you see this this battle between government control, right? business being controlled by government, industry being controlled by government, uh, to them legitimately overnight being cut off, where you have no more government spending going out uh, for certain sectors uh, to sort of prevent uh, you know, inflation, to, uh, to open up the markets, uh, to, open up, to open up industry to free markets, okay? Uh, we'll look at another piece in terms of the fall of the Raj um, in, in India. Uh, we looked at it in terms of who's so a bunch of state controls. We looked at the ambassador car was an example in the video. Uh, you have this vehicle that starts, you know, produced the same time as Toyota, uh, but there's a lack of innovation. Uh, lack of innovation because there's no competition, right? So competition is no incentive to innovate, um, and, and you have, and I think what they actually refer to it in the, in the documentary is that you have, um, you have uh, uh, non-competitive companies like basically lazy companies, right? They have the right to be lazy uh, because there is no competition, right? They are competitive. Uh, what we're going to look at is the reason why we see these things sort of happen um, and sort of some of the legacy um, in the ways that this does actually take place. Um, oftentimes, uh, places will opt or they will uh, advocate for free trade only once uh, they become an industrial powerhouse. So once their industries have been developed, they then will ask, or they will then open up their markets to, to free trade. Uh, because by that point, they have a competitive advantage. Yeah? History, legacy, the know-how, the knowledge uh, would exist within that marketplace by that time. Uh, so Britain was one of the first countries to actually uh, industrialize. Uh, you know, started to ask for free trade once that happened, because it was sort of incentive to do so. An important thing to sort of remember here is that um, oftentimes things work for the first, but they don't work for the people that come after. And uh, under different political systems, they're going to function differently. Uh, obviously, many people try to emulate this. They try to adopt this practice as well, uh, where they would start to shield off emerging domestic markets that they wanted to protect. Eventually, once they were developed, they would then open them up to the free market. Uh, now, with that being said, there are some situations where we see this backfire, right? So the Indian example is a really good example of this. Okay? So again, it doesn't function everywhere, it doesn't work everywhere. Uh, barriers will be extremely strong in the beginning, right? Why well, I'm trying to develop, uh, you're gonna put a lot of either, uh, you're gonna disincent this, you're basically gonna create either taxes, tariffs, uh, you're going to create any form of red tape that you possibly think of, prevent anybody from coming in and competing with those industries. Make sense? Once that happens, once those barriers, uh, uh, once the, 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 the companies sort of start to develop, those barriers are basically removed, um, and then it's, it's then opened up to, to sort of competition. So that's the 19th century the US, Germany, France, some other European nations, um, as well as Japan. In the 20th century, we see this with East Asia and Latin America, right? So that's sort of the examples that you start to see where they have uh, protectionist sort of policies to sort of prevent people from so what are the ways that they do this, okay? Remember, we're still looking at states as, as, uh, as regulators at this point. We look at, as, as, um, we look at them in terms of um, as regulators, we're looking at them in terms of competitors, uh, we look at them in terms of sort of these containers, right? Uh, so we're still looking at them at, in terms of uh, regulators. The first thing we're gonna look at is import substitution industrialization. Uh, what this basically is, um, is you're basically going to Manufacture products that you would otherwise bring in, right? You manufacture things that you would otherwise import, okay, into your into your uh, into your market. Um, so again, this is based on protectionist uh, protection against such imports. The way that you do this is you probably tax them. Uh, you put up any barrier uh, that would basically make it less um, attractive those products to come in. You could ban them completely. Here's another option. 
Um, again, so what are you doing? We're protecting this competition so that industry can flourish without some of that uh, sort of I mean, any negative force that would make it more difficult for that to actually happen. Okay. And the import substitution uh, industrialization is a long-term sequential process. Okay, so it's not something that uh, that happens necessarily overnight. And obviously, there's a lot of government incentives and potential policies that are put forth. Okay. Along with import substitution industrialization and export-oriented industrialization, it's a little bit different. Um, we saw this a lot of Asian countries, uh, China specifically. Um, this was actually supported by Asian Development Bank and the World Bank, and it was made possible by a variety of factors. One, obviously, being rapid liberalization, um, and so as it became freer to trade in general between places, uh, becoming an export-oriented economy uh, made a little bit more sense, right? Because all of a sudden there was an incentive, or there was no red tape in you being able to actually do these types of things. Um, so with the growth of worldwide trade after 1960, you got countries that said, okay, look, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on exports. Yeah, we're gonna create things, uh, we're gonna create products, we're gonna manufacture products uh, that are going to be used in foreign markets. Technology also played a role in this. Uh, technology played a major role in the sense that um, as it became easier to ship things, uh, the world has generally become smaller as a result of that with telecommunications, uh, the ability to, uh, to, to not only speak to, but uh, again, uh, ship and, 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 and provide products to places where traditionally you didn't. Uh, as that became easier, it actually resulted in uh, sort of a promotion uh, or incentives to, to actually start to partake in these types of things. Uh, this also resulted in sort of transnational corporations uh, that were constantly looking for location-specific advantages. Okay, uh, you know, you, you, Sort of in a, in a nutshell, I think mean, China is a really good example of this. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, uh, places where they, they you know, focus on exports. I mean, you can start to see you know, TNC, they're looking to leverage uh, cheaper products, and a cheaper cost of product, uh, because also their margin is getting greater or larger. Okay, and so with this part of TNCs, there's more incentive to do this, or it's more common uh, at that point. Uh, what was the government involvement in this? Uh, governments will oftentimes devalue their currency. If the currency becomes devalued, it makes their exports more competitive, right? Because all of a sudden it's cheaper to actually purchase those things. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how they do that. Um, um, not when we start talking about extractive industries a little bit, we'll talk about that. Um, they can have huge export trade uh, policy measures put in place to, uh, again, promote uh, that growth. I provide the figure numbers, it's in the textbook chapter, you can find the figure, and it provides you a little bit more detail, okay, that's why they're there. Uh, labor, obviously, is an important resource requirement, and, and so uh, you may have, uh, again, uh, people that enter those labor forces as a, as a result to, or they may encourage people to get into those labor, uh, labor markets in order to uh, produce what they are required to make sense provide incentives for those types of things. You know, again, uh, uh, it provides a uh, available employment for those markets. Uh, labor unions are problematic uh, oftentimes when it comes to these types of things. And so uh, governments might sometimes actually restrict um, or even suppress the role of unions uh, within those markets so uh, they can have Cheap labor, they can exploit cheap labor uh, without very much consequence. Um, you know, these, these things are quite fundamental. I mean, if you look at developing nations versus developed nations, fundamentally different types of working environments uh, that are in those markets. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Now we're going to look at states as competitors. Okay. Um, how and why do states compete? So when I talk about states as competitors, what am I talking about? What am I talking about if I say state as a competitor? Yeah. 
fun to do with foreign markets or the free market. Um, how, you know, how do you get the sort of the, maybe the, the I don't know if I told so I'm sick, by the way. So I apologize if you can see my 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 uh I think I told you guys. My my levels of energy are quite low today. So I apologize in advance. I have like I'm flighting something bad. So I apologize. That's why I'm sitting. I feel like I'm gonna pass out at any point. Um <coughs> Anyway, if you're wondering why I'm sitting or quieter than usual, uh, that's why. Um, free markets, yes. Um, to compete, so think about things like, you know, Asia being the world's factory, right? Or China being, you know, a country that wants to be the world's factory, or pride itself in the fact that it is the world's factory, in terms of how it produces. Um, it is competing, right? Those products are competing in the world market. Does that make sense? I was thinking like, uh, in government, they need to get taxes. Mm -hmm. So if your market is doing pretty well, eventually you got to spend more taxes in the government to spend more money or whatever. For other things, yeah. Well, you attract business there, it gives you an opportunity to get money from those businesses, right? Um, definitely. Uh, so I mean, it's a, it's a fundamentally important aspect when you think about uh, what governments are trying to do in terms of what they're trying to do. Uh, but that is a huge part, right? There's actually you know, there's fiscal, uh, there's actually monetary uh, incentives for you know for them to compete. How they compete obviously uh, will vary from place to place. Um, what they attract will vary from place to place. Um, there's industries, uh, definitely, but. A big part is to attracting global investment. Yeah? Uh, to, to basically attract people to actually go into these places and do these things. Um, again, uh, the idea with the removal of central planning, all of a sudden uh, you have a growth um, in states acting as competitive countries that, that global marketplace, right? Where you have uh, you know, resource companies and then ultimately sort of a resource base coming into your marketplace. Okay? Uh, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the Porter's Diamond. Another business application to help us understand, um, basically help us understand uh, how states sort of function as competitors. Uh, well, Porter basically argued, again, a business, I always, I always sort of talk about business as a, as a perspective. We talk about that, or a, from a business perspective, because we try to make things that are very complex in these linear kind of you know, uh, models that help people understand what they mean. But the reality is it's actually quite complex. Uh, but what Porter tries to do is it tries to explain national kind of advantages and how they're basically created through these like, local kind of processes that exist internally to the country in, in, in which they're in. Um, and so it tries to make something that's extremely complex uh, sort of explained in a, in, a, in, a, in a fair bit linear kind of way. Um, so what they basically do uh, or what Porter basically did is, okay, look, there's, there's a series of things, right? We've got factor conditions and demand conditions. And from the factor conditions sort of perspective, uh, what you have is uh, you, have, you have a set of things that, that are inherited but not created by those places that exist within those markets, within those states, okay? Uh, these are things like skill levels, yeah? Uh, knowledge, yeah, of that individual population. This can be things like sophisticated fiscal infrastructure, Okay, so uh, transportation and communication. Okay, that exists, again, the factor condition, uh, conditions that exist in those places. When we look at demand conditions, uh, here we're talking about uh, the proximity of that country to the right type of buyer, to the right type of market that would be likely to purchase that. And I say proximity uh, because geography generally uh, you know, matters okay, in terms of where some of those activities take place. If you look at Canada, our largest trading partner is is dot 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 the U.S. Uh, it's one of those things that always irritates me. You know, who cares what happens in the U.S. Yeah, I don't care. I, I don't care about this that happens in the U.S. I don't care. Yeah, I'll, sit, I'll, you know, I'll be at a, at a party with family and I'll hear somebody always come up and say, "Oh, let, let, let them kill themselves." Who cares? Yeah. I'm not sitting there like, what do you mean? Yeah. It matters so much. Um, from employment, think about think about the oil or oil industry. Uh, think about I mean, our oil industry exists because we have somebody who buys it. 
it is so expensive to extract from the tar sand um, that the fact that we have somewhere where they're purchasing it and we're finding it uh, for use is important. The fact that uh, it would be difficult for us to transport that oil other places, extremely difficult for us to transport it to other places, it would be hard for us to find another buyer. Right? Make sense? You can find somebody, uh, but you know, with some of those agreements, they might not exist to the same degree. So that's a huge, that's a huge, huge hurdle. Like, I mean, if you think about it, things that you rely on. Remember, I, I talked about this this morning with the, the other class, but you think about the, the mad cow scare and what it meant for Albertans uh, when all of a sudden the U.S. closed off their borders to, to buying cattle from, from, from Canada. Yeah? All right, so you have entire employment sectors that rely on this. Think about the automotive industry. Yeah? With their factories being stationed in, in, in Canada, right? Huge, huge number of people being employed by those industries. So it's, hell, I mean, it's, it's problematic yeah, to, to think that these places are not uh, competitive. So, um, again, uh, if we're talking about states being competitive, so they have a set of factory conditions that are internal to them, they got a bunch of demand conditions. A big part has to do with proximity to the right of the buyer in the sense that who's going to buy the stuff that we have uh, or is going to leverage these. Uh, these things that we have, these factor conditions that might be attractive, yeah? Maybe it's cheap labor, maybe it's the know-how for a specific skill set, uh, or, or a specific skill set to, to be able to actually do something, okay? Uh, within that, we got obviously firms, right? So firm strategies. Uh, so again, what are the goals of, uh, of domestic firms? Are there any domestic rivalries um, in terms of competition within those markets, okay? And then basically, we have uh, also related and supported industries. Uh, so it'd be like supplier industries, think about automotive, that's a big part of the right supply side. Uh, so you have sort of these four, it's called the four dynamics, these four sort of things that help you understand uh, sort of what drives uh, states to be, to gain competitive advantage within those places. So again, you have factory conditions, you have demand conditions, you've got firm strategy, structure, and rivalry, so competition within that market. And then the supporting industries that are basically required to have those things happen. Along with those two things is you have the government, yeah, and you've got chance. Uh, when we talk about chance, this is the, again the occasional random occurrence. So maybe an innovation, a historical accident um, that might result in, in, in there being, um, you know, uh, some sort of competitive advantage that might be created as a result of chance. Uh, a really good example um, of chance would be uh, with the Pfizer example, we're talking about Viagra, right? Uh, the proper name for Viagra is Sildenafil. Sildin yeah. No, anybody? Uh, but again, they found a vaccine, right? We talked about that. Uh, it was, um, right, they were trying to, uh, it was for heart, right? It was for some sort of heart issue, and then it had this other effect. Um, and that happened by chance. Yeah, that was an accident. Yeah, they weren't trying to find an erectile dysfunction drug, right? It just, they, they, they developed this drug to do something and it did something else. And they're like, oh, wait a minute, we can, is it safe? Yes, okay, we can package this and sell it to people. Right, and that was basically what it, I don't know if you guys noticed on the radio, there's a lot of Pfizer commercials. No, have you ever realized recently? Like tons of Pfizer commercials telling you to ask for their brand when you go to, when you go to the, no? Anyone notice this? Am I the only one that noticed this? Anyone else listen to the radio? I do it you what? Um, if, the, if you, anyone here listens to the Fan 590, if you're driving this in the Fan 590, you have a second commercial is about Pfizer saying, hey, when you go to the doctor, don't just get cholesterol medication, ask for Lipitor. When you go to the doctor, don't just ask for, uh, you know, uh, whatever the, the proper drug name is, Viagra is. Ask for Viagra. Right? So they're, they're trying to promote their drugs, right? To, to the market. Anyway, I thought it was interesting. It's been like, about well, six months now, every time I listen to the radio, I get this Pfizer commercial that comes up. Um, because I, again, our laws in Canada force their, your medical practitioners to basically give you, um, <coughs> uh, to give you the no name generic brand, right? Um, unless you specifically ask for the non-generic brand. Um, and obviously government. So from a government perspective, here we're talking about uh, them basically influencing these things to actually happen. And so when we're talking about for your assignments, okay, we're talking about the state, the role of the state in, uh, as basically a driver of globalization, 
Um, governments have the ability to sort of influence any one of these major four determinants uh, that exist, right? Uh, by, by passing different laws, by putting up different red tape, by regulating, by enacting policies, uh, they can basically determine um, you know, certain demand conditions. Uh, they can uh, obviously affect factor conditions that might be local to those places. It's a little harder from that perspective, but uh, again, they can again affect demand conditions and the supporting industries, either allowing them to exist there or not, things of that nature. Yeah. So again, very easy way to understand national competitive advantage. It is one of those diamond. Uh, but in actuality, it's a lot more complex than that. Right? Uh, there's a lot of history that things from actually in place. Any questions? Again, uh, uh, natural circumstances are really, really important. It's really hard to face, to face rather foreign competition when it's not based at home. Uh, competition again forces innovation, and that and that acts as, as again um, as competition in that domestic front. Okay. Uh, some criticisms. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a reductionist kind of uh, model, so you compress highly complex, highly complex sort of ideas into these four points that are supposed to be all encompassing and somehow explain how this action takes place. Uh, the role of the state in these situations, in my opinion, uh, and the textbook obviously has a similar opinion, um, is the fact that uh, the role of, of states as uh, you know, helping with these competitive sort of advantages is highly, uh, highly under, uh, understated um, in the sense that you know it talks about, oh yeah, they can influence one of these four major determinants, but if you think about it, uh, the, the histories of those governments that regulate these things will, will, will dictate everything. Yeah. In terms of how they function, where they function, when they function, um, you know, uh, whether they're allowed to function or not. Okay, so uh, uh, again, the, the 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 idea of state is heavily understood. Um, in it endures the influence of transnationalization. Okay, so in the sense, uh, assets of a transnational corporation is influenced by foreign uh, by foreign countries. Um, and so, um, this again ultimately could influence competition within your uh, within the, the, the actual home market. And so, um, you know, why are we talking about uh, you know, the growth of TNCs and the, and the role of things? I want to go back to your assignment. I talked about I think TNCs play a role and they can lobby for things. I think states are more important because they have the ultimate decision is theirs, whether they're influenced by TNCs or not. Does that make sense? I think that uh, states have. Uh, a lot of that, uh, uh, they have a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of that powers in their hands, basically, right, to, to make those decisions. Um, but you could take the perspective of transnational corporations um, in the sense that a TMC has, uh, has a lot of sort of uh, leverage in terms of how and where they use them, right? So we can go back to OLI theory. Um, what they leverage, what they bring to the table, and that's not that's not even considered in this. Um, if you think about competition, TNCs um, have the ability to leverage location specific advantage, the opponent specific advantages, um, uh, uh, internal advantages that they can uh, that they can basically leverage, which adds to that sort of degree of competition that actually exists. And they're not talking about that role of TNCs within that, right? within this global marketplace. Um, okay. Uh, here we're looking at uh, actually what we'll do. Okay, we'll watch this last piece of uh, sort of India. We'll take a break and we'll talk to see if it's collaborating. of the Soviet Union reverberated round the world. For India, it was the end of a world. The ideal of central planning shattered. This was a telling uh, proof uh, that a command type of economy was not as secure as we had thought. Therefore, the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major factor which influenced thinking 
on economic reforms in our country and in other countries. Planned by bureaucrats and cut off from world trade, India's economy had grown stagnant, inefficient, and in debt. In 1991, India stared bankruptcy in the face. We were borrowing heavily. We had to mortgage our gold deposits. Our growth rate had come to virtually zero. All this added to a very enormous crisis. In the midst of the crisis, the economist Manmohan Singh received an urgent call from the new Prime Minister. He found himself appointed Finance Minister. Well, I said to him that we are on the verge of collapse. Our foreign exchange reserves when I took over were no more than a billion dollars. That is roughly equal to two weeks' imports. The argument was quite simple. We were in the midst of an unprecedented crisis. It was time to think big. To the horror of his own political party, the Prime Minister gave the green light for free market reform. Well, the rank and file of the party was simply bewildered. They did resist the kind of changes that we brought about. But we presented them the hard facts that unless all this was done, the economy would simply collapse. India's permit Raj was in. State control was reduced. Government subsidies were cut. Tariffs and trade barriers reduced and regulatory licenses eliminated. We got government off the backs of the people of India, particularly uh, off the backs of India's entrepreneurs. We introduced more competition to release the innovative skills which were always there in India. The economy turned around much sooner and much more deeply than I had anticipated. Indian industry boom. We created a record number of jobs. We were able to control inflation and the economy was growing at the rate of 7% per annum, so our critics were completely silenced. Okay, uh, so if you remember from last week, we talked about, um, uh, we talked about uh, Watch that little piece on India. Um, and a big part of, of, of what happened there was you have this sort of um, uh, sort of government control in terms of the private sector. Um, so basically, no business can basically be created or set up legally without going through all these sort of hurdles, right? So that's what all this red tape um, uh, that basically prevented or made it very difficult for any company to sort of set up. And that existed in like 1947 to about the, the 80s. Um, and again, hugely problematic, it resulted in the black market. You had a lot of people bypass the corruption. There a lot of corruption in terms of you know, people paying bribes uh, to get business licenses set up uh, so that they could operate in these markets because they were restricted to what they could do. Um, what you just saw in that last piece that they were basically talking about was uh, they basically, you know, in the, in the 80s, uh, governed the government in terms of. Um, uh, the role that they played, um, or how much of a role they played in sort of setting up those businesses, uh, uh, more in terms of uh, restricting certain types of businesses. And what that basically did is they removed that protectionist kind of mentality, and all of a sudden uh, they opened their doors up, and that results in innovation, right? And so we saw the lack of innovation with ambassador cards, that creation of innovation, uh, or in discussing the creation of innovation, uh, that, that basically exists after that. Um, Again, uh, uh, this increases investment, uh, maybe increasing uh, sort of uh, uh, economic growth as well in those markets. Okay. Um, do you want me just to keep going and then we'll legitimately end early today? Just because I don't think I can. I know I always say it and then it's going to be I mean, legitimately this time. I'll talk about the, the test for Wednesday a little bit and that's what we should study. Or what it covers, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Does that sound okay? Yeah? Um, hopefully, another 20 minutes. Maybe 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> About 35 minutes.
That sounds sound reasonable. Okay. Uh, Stasis collaborators. Uh, when we talk about Stasis collaborators, we're really talking about sort of uh, uh, agreements that are signed between places that basically enable um, uh, economic sort of uh, functions to happen between places. Um, and so what we're going to look at here is trade agreements. And there's a variety of different types of trade agreements, and they're all important for a variety of different reasons um, in terms of what they uh, what they create, what they don't create. Um, but it, you know, we're going back to that sort of case of scale. You see the role of the state working with other states to basically uh, increase trade and to divert trade. Um, so when we talk about trade uh, uh, creation, you have oftentimes markets or countries that will start to replace home production. Production that happens on the home front in favor of having it happen um, in, in, some, in another place uh, because there's some sort of advantage to doing so. Uh, so if you look at NAFTA, you have huge, uh, you know, you have a lot of factories that start to reposition themselves um, in places where you can leverage cheaper labor, uh, where uh, there might be a skill set um, that's better than yours, and that you can, again, send those things with, with relative ease without being penalized or fined or taxed uh, to be able to actually do that. Um, and so what this does is, if, if, again, you're taking trade to replace your production, you start trading for that production. Uh, the trade that actually takes place oftentimes happens with those block nations, okay, um, that, that actually, uh, that are part of signed this agreement, right? So that is an example of this. Uh, you know, Canada trades most with uh, countries in North America. Why? We have these agreements in place. Uh, that the yes, are being questioned. We have these agreements in place with Canada, or with the U.S. and Mexico, which allow products to move between these places much more freely. Yeah. What's the block? The block is just the block. We refer to block nations. They're the nations that sign on these agreements that are part of that block, the regional blocks that you can sort of see. Okay. Uh, by default, these also result in trade diversions, and so you're more inclined to trade with people inside your block, with people that have signed this agreement with you, than with anybody outside of it, uh, because there's no incentive to go outside. There may also be restrictions from going outside, and so uh, you might be taxed, or the agreement might say, okay, look, you can only do this, you know, this percentage of of, uh, of trade with nations that are outside of this agreement. Um, so we'll look at some of these examples, okay? Uh, so again, it's, uh, you know, oftentimes these agreements they take a while to get signed, but they usually tend to be a win-win for most for most parties. Uh, so there are four basic types that we can sort of identify. Uh, the first being a free trade area. A free trade area. This is your example of NAFTA. Okay, NAFTA is a free trade area. And we'll look at some other examples that I have listed. Yeah, um, in one of the slides. Take a look at uh, some of the other ones, but now just an example. Is, what it basically is a re is a rule of trade restrictions between member states. Okay, and that's what NAFTA is. Uh, the member states, there's very few restrictions in terms of trade, and so products can flow pretty pretty easily between places. There are um, obviously um, uh, some things that are not included in those agreements, so it would be like meat, meat byproducts, uh, for whatever reasons might be. Uh, might be uh, restricted within that, but generally products will be uh, relatively free. This makes up about 90% um, of all of the different types of uh, uh, motivations for, or uh, all the types of uh, trade agreements that actually exist. Right? So 90% of the ones that exist are free trade areas. We also have customs unions, which are a little bit different. Uh, here you have member states, free trade with each other, uh, but they also establish a common general trade policy to non-members. So anyone who's a non-member is going to have uh, uh, the countries that are part of that block are going to have restrictions in terms of what they can do with those non-members. Okay? So all that does is it reinforces those relationships with the member, with member areas and it promotes more trade between them. Okay? The third is a common market. In the common market, we have trade barriers between member states are removed. So again, free trade between the members of those, uh, of those agreements. They have a common external trade policy, so everybody that's part of that block uh, will have the same uh, regulations or restrictions in terms of how they trade with outside members. Okay, and they also have free movement of factors of production and capital so in, in the form of capital and labor between those member states. Yeah, so they can work. Okay. Uh, uh, money, right? So the function uh, they're going to be treated differently within that type of agreement. And then 
Uh, you have economic unions, and there's only one economic union, um, and that is that of uh, the European Union. So it's important to understand that it's not a, it's a monetary union, it's not a fiscal union. Every country that's part of the econo uh, part of the EU is allowed to tax their people at whatever rate that they want. Uh, they're not restricted in how they tax their uh, their uh, their own people, uh, but there is this monetary um, there's this monetary sort of uh, you know policy that are in place. Um, you know, they have standard currency. Not all state, not, not all members. I mean, I'm currently all members. Yeah, the only member that didn't was the UK, right? Which was uh, so, which included um, uh, Britain, um, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland, right? They they got to their own currencies, um, but uh, they that basically with their removal now everybody's on the on the, on the euro. Uh, so again, common currency. Uh, again, they have they might have some broader sort of economic policies that they don't have to abide by. They restrict who they can trade for from outside. Uh, they create their own passport, they remove borders in between in terms of how capital and labor can move between those places. Anybody here have a European passport? So I was, uh, I'll give you an example. Like I was, um, I used to have an Italian passport. My parents were born in Italy, so I have the right to speak to, I have a Canada with the right to dual citizenship. Um, and so I had an Italian passport, and I also had a, a Canadian passport. Um, my father was always worried about me getting an Italian passport, and he grew up there and he had mandatory military, right? So there was that fear that they could call me to join the military, uh, which they don't do anymore anyway, but at the time they did. Um, and I was four. Um, anyway, so I had an Italian passport. I got that changed automatically when I when they converted, uh, when they, they joined, right? Like, and if you think about the, yeah, like, like slogans and songs for joining the EU, it was crazy, right? The EU existed for a long time, like, the uh, in trade agreements that started at one level and started to sort of diffuse over space. And as it started to diffuse, it just added new member states and then it added new policies in terms of what they could do and how they could do it. And then eventually they got the currency and eventually they opened up the borders. Um, but anyways, anyway, I converted to have a European passport as a Canadian, I'm a Canadian citizen. I'm a Canadian before I'm European, even though I, I get, uh, I'm allowed to vote. Yeah, I get paid for I never vote because I feel kind of ridiculous when you vote on something that I'm not experiencing firsthand necessarily, uh, but I have the right to vote, um, and I have the right to work anywhere. I have the right to, to, to health care. Uh, I work in those places. I have the right to pensions. Um, like I have like, the ability to move to Europe, um, and I can decide where I'm going to live uh, with very little I mean, restriction. I remember my sister moved to Italy, and she decided to go to move back, she ended up coming back anyway, but she lived there for like a year and a half. Uh, for two years, uh, where she just really picked up from the class, did her passport, she went there, she could work, she could do everything she wanted. She was an Italian citizen in their eyes, or European citizen in their eyes, so it made no difference on uh, what she did, um, or, or how often, like, we're, like, it was just, so if you think about it, that's a huge incentive in one, you know, sort of in one, uh, in one aspect, right? Like, when you, when you sit there and you think about it, any person can move freer, freely with the people that are taking work and live, um, that poses a lot of problems, though, doesn't it? Yeah? And I'm not going uh, to ask for a raise of hand if you think it's a good idea that that uh, Britain exits the, the EU, because uh, that could cause a lot of bad conversations in the face of this class, so that I don't really sort of deal with. Um, so I'm not going to ask that question, but I'm sure you can foresee some, some problems with this type of stuff. Yeah? Can you think of some problems when you open up your borders, these types of things? And oftentimes it's not true. Sometimes the things you hear are actually um, largely inaccurate. Yeah? So the perceptions that people have. I remember when, when the EU first got enacted in Italy. I remember going to Italy, and with very little money, Canadian money, I could buy a lot of things. Yeah? Tons of things. Then they got the EU. I couldn't do that anymore. Yeah? Number one, because all of a sudden the currency was, was much higher than Canadian dollars. So the conversion, I was losing 30% of my dollar every single time. Yeah, so buck thirty for a buck, buck thirty five, now I think like buck forty, yeah? Something like that, buck forty. Yeah, so I'm losing already forty percent off my dollar the second I convert, let alone you into the store and also the price points or things are were fundamentally different than the other city. So the cost went up. And when I went to Italy or I went to Europe, I uh, heard the same thing from a lot of people in Southern Europe. 
just sort of same rhetoric that came out of it. It was that, oh, when they convert it to the euro, if something used to cost uh, a, a thousand lira before, it now costs one euro. So like the lira was the time, so they count the pennies, yeah? So in old time currency, they would, so it was the lira, and the value of the lira would be the equivalent of how many pennies it was for it, right? So does that make sense? So if a dollar, a dollar is a hundred lira, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So that's how it was. And so if, they had, it was a, if it was 100 lira before, now it was 1 euro. If it was a thousand, it was 10 bucks before, now it was 10 euro. Right? Or whatever it was. So that, that, that conversion really thing. But what, at work, and this is what they said, was that they used to make, you know, of the equivalent of $100 worth of lira before, now they make 50 euro. So they converted the, the currency rate to account for the change between the lira and the euro. And that's what they would get paid. But the cost of everything had increased. Yeah? So that was a problem that people vocalized. How accurate that was in terms of most payments, I'm not sure. Let alone if the products in the stores are changing and converting that, even if you're making the equivalent of that you are in Lita, in, in, in Euro, it still is somewhat problematic from a, a person's standpoint when you go to the store and you start to see those types of things. It can cause you that. What else? What are some other things that you could expect with economic views why some countries would not want this? Yeah. Um, well, I'm thinking like the EU, there might be like a brain drain in uh, certain like poorer countries where people that are like highly skilled um, would be moving to like countries where like the, the conditions are better. Um, perhaps you, you think about uh, people with certain skills moving to other places? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, it is a definite possibility that you could have people... Um, I think people are less concerned about that kind of stuff, but if this happened, um, I think they're more concerned about uh, sort of those middle class jobs being lost by member states moving into those places. But yeah, there's an employment aspect, right? All of a sudden, uh, the workforce is, is significantly larger than it was in the past. And all of a sudden, you know, in, in areas... So I'll give an example again, where the part of that my parents are from, a lot of factories, right? A lot of factories, soap factories, uh, beer, uh, they used to make Heineken there, actually. Um, they, uh, I was, Heineken now is like an Italian beer, but it was a huge factory, employed a lot of people in the region. You remember the population size is fundamentally smaller than what you'd be used to. Um, and so we think about that region, again, from an employment perspective, um, you know, major, 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 you know, there were steel factories. Uh, a variety of things was a uh, Fiat uh, car, like in the, in the region, uh, what do you call it? Uh, an, auto, uh, an auto plant, okay? That employed people. All of a sudden, when you open up those borders, all, you know, people can move freely between those places and they can somewhat take up that work. Uh, all of a sudden, you have people that are willing to do certain jobs, yeah? For less money than you would, and then it points to shit towards those individuals as well, uh, which is, would you do the, I, I always like, there's a lot of racism in certain parts of Europe. Like, you have conversations with people that live there and hear things, and they're like, are, are you for real? Like, would you go and do that job? Well, no. Well, why are you upset at the times I'm doing it? Like, what Italian would do that job? In some of those conversations that you have, they don't want the job because that job doesn't pay a lot of money, and then they get upset when somebody goes and actually takes that job. Yeah. Not everybody, I want to make this something clear. I'm not saying that everybody's like this. Everybody thinks this way. It's just this is the way people think. Um, in, in some of these types of situations. Um, all of a sudden you go from small towns where your neighbors or your family members to all of a sudden your neighbor being, you know, from another country. Yeah? Um, that changes sort of the dynamic to, you know, the, uh, some of that flavor the kids in terms of uh, even children, what they feel is right and what's wrong. Uh, when the children go to school, they feel a lot of those tensions as well. Yeah? You gotta remember in a place where uh, your identity was very, uh, you know, was created based on the borders of your country. Where if you, especially in like rural areas, everybody that lived there was Italian or was Spanish or was Portuguese, and all of a sudden, you know, you got people from other countries that are that, that are living there uh, that aren't part of that mold. How do you handle that, right? Um, you know, we live in a market that's it, 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 it extremely multicultural. So that, you know. It's hard for us to really understand. It's hard for me to understand this. I'm, I'm Canadian before I'm anything else. Um, and, you know, I think one of the cool things I said in this classroom, I was, you know, at, 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 at 
people here, I can tell there's people from all kinds of backgrounds, uh, all different types of religions, all different types of, you know, uh, cultural norms that might exist from, you know, where you're from. And it's okay here. Yeah? Yeah? In other places, it might not be, because they don't know what that is. Like, religion's a huge part. When, when, when the, religion, the religious makeup of a country, especially in Southern Europe, is 95% uh, Roman Catholic, and all of a sudden you have an influx of people that are coming in uh, from with different religious backgrounds, and they're not, you know, uh, what you call like, like street vendors, yeah, or whatever. How, how, how do you how do you cope with things like that? How do you deal with that? So that poses some 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 tensions, right? So there's tension from that perspective that exists definitely. What else? What's some of the positives? First of all, everybody here see positives and things like the European Union? Yeah. Stability. There's been no wars since the EU was formed. Yeah? In that region of the world. That's a big deal. This is a war torn place. Yeah? Two world wars. Yeah? A lot of civil wars. Else. For some benefit. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's more efficient. When you have people following the same rules and the same benefits. An efficiency aspect for sure. I mean, there's an opportunity aspect. There's countries that are waiting to get into this. You got countries that want to leave, but you got countries that are begging to get in. Yeah? They're begging to get in because there's huge economic opportunity. Right? There's a huge opportunity that exists in getting into these things because all of a sudden, you have the right to trade and sell your commodities to people that are now allowed to buy them. Yeah? You're not part of that EU, you're sort of isolated. Yeah? Remember, every European Union member has uh, has uh, rules and policies in terms of who they can trade with outside of that union. So if you're outside of that union, you're at a disadvantage. It's a problem that, that Britain's going to experience, right? Because now they have to recite all their agreements with all the individual nations, or maybe with the EU as a whole. Right? Because who they can trade with. The majority of their trading partners are inside that union. That's a problem. Yes, there's a benefit from an economic perspective for, for different countries to move uh, to move products to different places, right? What else? Well, for people, for young people. There's a benefit for young people. Yeah. They can work all across Europe. They can work all across Europe. Now I mean there's you know, silver lining when you start thinking about these things. Unemployment in, in some places in Southern Europe are, are for, for people that are around your age, yeah? so people in their 20s, uh, between 20 and 30, is as high as 50%. 50% unemployment. That's crazy. Yeah? Can you imagine? Imagine if I told you, all right, guys, 50% of you are going to get jobs, 50% of you are not going to get jobs. If 50% of you do get jobs, I mean, you know, it might not be in anything that like, you would remotely consider or something somehow related or relevant to what you did in school. Good luck. And it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah? Fifty percent near fifty percent unemployment. Yeah? So yeah, you can move and, and work in other places, assuming that there's opportunities in other places. Anything else? Yeah. Well, actually, like, regarding your point, um, I, I was born in Latvia, and like we still have a lot of like family friends there, and literally like everyone that's young is moving out of there because like jobs are like non-existent. They recently became like, uh, yeah, they recently got into the EU, and like yeah, everybody just wants to leave, and then the, the benefit of of them getting into the EU is that everyone can kind of leave freely. Yeah, they don't have to like immigrate. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's a very different kind of laws in terms of, like, you don't have to go through some, you know, as much red tape to, to actually move uh, entire families over to, to other places, for sure. I mean, so there are, it's like, if you think about it, like, there's, there's all kinds of things. Obviously, we're just touching the surface on, on what actually takes place in these places. Unfortunately, um, a lot of stuff that we do learn about is, is a lot of the negative things that you hear, right? You always see those problems with big nations, right? Portugal, Ireland, uh, Greece. Uh, Italy, uh, Spain, right? Major, major issues in Southern Europe uh, with, uh, with them being part of the EU. And, and you know, they perceive being part of the EU, maybe they would have existed regardless. But 
either way, right? There's a lot of this sort of negativity that we hear. And then you have a country that decides to vote on leaving the number one Google thing the next day. Do you remember that? What? The number one Google thing the day after uh, Britain, after the Brexit vote was what is the EU? That was the number one Google term. It's scary, man. It's scary. You have a nation that voted to leave something that has so many economic implications and their people had no idea what the heck it was. They're, they voted basically, not everybody, I want to make this clear, but they voted on the rhetoric of, 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 like, of a very racist kind of ideas, right? They, and that's not everybody, I want to make this clear, okay? But there's a lot of people that voted thinking like, this is going to help us keep the Muslims up. Like that was legitimately, somebody was interviewed the day after like Manchester and they were asked that, that that's what it was, we're going to keep the Muslims up. Uh, last time I checked, there's not one Muslim nation that has signed into the European Union. Not one. Yeah? To be honest, you know, Turkey wants to get in, but because they're Muslim, it's one of the reasons why they're not. Yeah? But they're not looking for a halter in us, one of the reasons. Yeah? That they're not allowed in. That's religion. Okay? So, what do you mean? First of all, why does it matter? And second, why does, what do you mean? Right? Especially you know, a place like like Britain, which is so multicultural. It's incredibly multicultural. It's kind of weird. Yeah, like you start to hear these things, you're like, what? What do you mean? Like, where, where's this coming from? Yeah, but there's a lot of that that's rooted in these types of things. Yeah? And when you have both, you know, another problem is you have, you know, one country that accepts refugees from a place and one that doesn't. Once they're there and they get status, where they go, right? You know, that helps people consider that, that steal some of that rhetoric. Um, uh, here we're looking at uh, the growth of, uh, of free trade. So we saw in 1994, we had the World Trade Organization established, and you see this sort of uh, you know, major growth, exponential growth in, uh, in the amount of trade that actually happens. A lot of this trade actually takes place with, uh, within regional trade agreements. Right, so we're largely based on regional trade agreements that are signed between uh, about a third of them are actually within the, those types of, uh, of regions. So if you bring it, the World Trade Organization, you have this macro level of reduction or trade liberalization that takes place. Uh, but really what fostered increased trade was these blocks, uh, these trade agreements that start to happen. Okay, so again, a third of all trade uh, happens with these trade agreements. Okay. Now this just shows uh, some of those agreements that exist between places. The dark blue ones are one that exist, and the gray ones are the ones that are currently being negotiated. Um, and so these are really contentious issues when, when people are part of the party. Uh, but you hear this all the time. There's a lot of conversation around this. Okay. So here's just uh, examples of, of of the different types that exist. So uh, here we've got economic union, the European Union, NAFTA is a free trade area, EFTA, which is the European Free Trade Association. Uh, you have common market in the southern cone, which is called the southern cone common market, which includes uh, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Venezuela. Uh, ENCOM, the ENI common market, which is the customs union, uh, which includes Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela. Uh, the Caribbean community, which is a common market, it shows also the dates in terms of when they were uh, started. Uh, this is a bit dated. Uh, there, anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so the European Union, uh, what the community initially existed of in 1957, obviously the laws and, and regulations in those places were different. Um, in 1973, uh, you have enlargement that takes place yeah, in the UK. 81, 86, further enlargement, Spain and Portugal included. 1995 enlargement, you got Sweden and Finland, so you have the you know, Scandinavian country, or actually just things on the Scandinavian Uh, 2004, uh, further enlargement again from seven, and then you have candidate uh, states, right? People that are trying to get in. So you got Macedonia, Croatia, uh, uh, Turkey, okay, that are trying to get into the UK. And obviously you have the UK out. Okay, so again, it's just looking at the different regions that uh, the Asia Pacific Economic Union is one that we're going to use up here a bit. Uh, basically, we uh, I mean, a lot of different nations. Uh, one of the things that stopped, uh, that, that had prevented this from being signed 
uh, was uh, supply management in Canada with certain types of industries. One of the types of issues that that actually prevented it from going forward. Uh, China and the U.S. really upset with Canada because uh, we basically uh, have our, it's not, it's not a subsidy, but it's kind of like a subsidy in the sense that we provide incentives to our farmers, and that, that makes it less competitive. It's not open to the free market. When we trade agreements with the state, the state is a kind of size is, if it's all free between us, we can do whatever, right? Things can be freer, and so you can't, you can't be giving your, your countries an incentive, like your country, the members of your country and those industries an incentive to operate. Because if you provide that, it's not fair anymore, right? It's not free market anymore. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. If, uh, if corn is being sold on the free market, the U.S. subsidizes corn heavily. Well, that's from that. Yeah. How is that? How, they have a competitive advantage at that point compared to someone in Mexico who's hoping the exact same thing but has to sell it at a higher price point uh, because there's no subsidy. Make sense? Okay. Uh, we're gonna watch the last piece of. Yeah, we'll watch the last. Piece. Last little piece of video, and I'll have a look at that. Any questions, first off? About that? Uh, I hope you start to understand the rule of the city, or, or states, not the city, sorry, um, of states within this, from what we talked about last week and this week, in terms of the role that they've played uh, in, in allowing some activities from taking place. So we're talking about globalization, I think you start to really get a sense of who actually controls what can happen and what doesn't happen. You have the entire economy is that things are restricted, there's red tape. Who's putting up that red tape? Yeah? You have places that are completely cut off from the rest of the world because of, of laws, because of protectionist kind of policies that are put forward. So who's promoting that? Who's responsible for that group, for that promotion? Does that, that make sense? Yeah? I always start to see that the, the state plays a huge role. Yes, TNC's lobby. Yes. TNCs may donate money uh, to certain political parties uh, where you know, they, might, or they might sign agreements with you know with states and, and have certain laws enacted that may favor them. And so they do play a role in there, but who has to make the ultimate decision? Does that make sense? So it'd be kind of foolish that technology drives this, because technology is used and it helps promote, but is it the one thing that's driving that? Not at all. Yeah, you might encourage it. Yeah, it gives them a means to actually do it. But the rationale as to why these countries do it is not rooted in that at all. Yeah, or is it rooted in what they allow and they don't allow? Yeah, and some of these things existed and started to be created well before you had this convergence between communication technology, right? This started from uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of that, that telecom wave that allows you to. You know, transfer information much faster, get things much faster, uh, where you have a sort of shrinking world that now exists. Yes, that promotes it. Yes, it creates things like these, you know, things that are quite far from one another to start all of a sudden decide on, on signing agreements with one another. How much is a role in that? But the reason why Canada wants to sign some agreements, or Japan, so Korea, or China, or Russia, or China, or China, or China part of that one thing, right? But, uh, uh, so there was, they were added to it, I think. China was eventually added to this, this agreement. Uh, or to the talks of the agreement. Uh, or Australia. A lot of this has to do with, uh, with those things. Okay. By the start of the new millennium, the decade of radical change was over. A world that not so long ago had looked to socialism, central planning, and protectionism now looked to the market. Breathtaking what's happened in the last 20 years or less. This is though the whole world has changed its mind. Everywhere, in India, China, Asia, in Latin America, in Europe, in North America, and above all in the communist world, governments have retreated from the commanding heights of the economy. Having thrown off communism, the countries of Eastern Europe continued to embrace free markets. Poland has flourished. What's driving Poland are two million small businesses, almost all started after economic reform. A 
of all the cases of shock therapy around the world, that in Poland worked uh, just about the best. It really got the economy going. Businesses like Zofia Belgique's gyms now employ over half of the country's workforce and produce close to 75% of these total outputs. After 1990, lots of companies and foreign firms appeared in Poland. The forecasts were very good, and I think they have come true. But we Poles need time for everything to fall into place. In Latin America, the result of reform has been mixed. Chile continues to set the pace. A democracy, it follows free market policies, and is one of the world's seven fastest growing economies. The first democratic president, after Pinochet, uh, maintained the reforms and also tried to improve on them. It's not something of the right wing or the left wing tactics. It's simply some economic policies. Now, to learn now, took some time. Bolivia is still poor but it has been growing. Many people would say, well, we're still poor. I would say to them, Bolivia, before we stabilized the economy, was a poor country with hyperinflation. Bolivia, after we stabilized the economy, is a poor country with stability. I think there is some disillusionment in Latin America that they have had uh, problems despite the reforms getting to a steady, high rate of growth is a difficult thing, and it certainly requires more than sorting out your inflation problem. And now we see a sort of financial collapse in Argentina. For several years, Argentina looked like the poster boy for economic reform, but it turned out that the reforms were quite incomplete. The country ran up huge international debts in 2002, it had an economic meltdown. At the end of the day, the strains were too much, and now we see a great deal of political turmoil, raising all kinds of questions for the future. In India, Narayan Murthy no longer needs 50 trips to Delhi for permission to import one computer. Instead, he has built one of the world's biggest software companies. India's economy has loosened up, and it is growing. Well, it did work. I think certainly it did work. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, it, all the parties that criticized the party that introduced reforms are now taking forward those, those reforms. So I think 91 to 2000 has shown that the economic liberalization which started out of compulsion has ended up being a process that is being driven by conviction. All this has brought about a sea change. In fact, nobody in India today who would question the correctness of the decision to open up India's economy. Even the communists grudgingly can see that this is the right path. In Russia, ironically, the 1998 stock market crash and the default on debts may have been a turning point. A second chance for Russia's still new market economy. Under President Putin, the institutions of a market economy strengthened and the oligarchs were reined in. Russia has changed a lot since the loans for shares deal of the mid-90s. It's had strong economic growth over the last several years. Companies have modernized, and a lot of the reform legislation that should have been done five or six or seven years ago has finally been enacted. I remain cautiously optimistic. But even if Russia gets out of this mess, even if democracy survives, even if all market reforms take root, and all of that is possible, the 1990s was so costly, unnecessarily, that uh, I'll 
never be able to look at it uh, and feel that, gee, it all ended up well in the end. The problems are still there, the problems of inadequate health care all the way to corruption, but it's a, it's a society that's, that's changing. President Putin sees Russia's future as being part of the world economy. Absolutely free of any old stereotypes. They don't remember communism. My son is coming home and asking me, Mom, can you tell me what Marxism is? We spent only 10 years after collapse of communism, and my son doesn't know what communism and Marxism is. The world had indeed changed its mind. Capitalism was now the rule almost everywhere. The stage was set for a single global marketplace, woven together by trade, technology, and investment. The era of globalization had begun. Okay, um, so we have a test on Wednesday, very printed, ready to go. It will be the exact same format. Last test, got 10 multiple choice, and then one or two for the short answer. It'll cover all content uh, from our last test. Okay? Not including, so not included with it, it's after the last test, all content that we covered. Including today. Including today. Okay? Any questions? I got perfect. I took the test. I got perfect. Not too bad. Yeah. I took the test actually. I took the test early, and I got perfect. An easy one, man. Bad job. All right. Well, that was good. 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 That was good.